guys happy? <laughs> the ladies in the front row. Oh my gosh. So then I'll just start in the back then. <laughs> I like the guys. <laughs> Well, happy Friday, and yes, it is an all-ladies crew in the front row. I wonder if there's history-making here today. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. I'm not sure what's going on with Andrea here. Got it? You're good? Yeah, it's Andrea. She's trying. She's trying, folks. All right. I don't see you very often, and when I do, you, you cause a ruckus. Okay, so today, President Biden awarded the Medal of Honor to a true hero of our nation, Colonel Paris Davis, for the gallantry he displayed at great personal risk that went above and beyond the call of duty during combat operations in Vietnam. You all heard President Biden tell Colonel Davis's story in powerful remarks, but I just want to say that Colonel Davis represents the best of America. Despite being wounded while leading his men in combat, he refused to leave the battlefield until all the members of his team were evacuated. His bravery and devotion to our country during this battle has been recognized before in the form of a silver star and a purple heart. But until today, he never received the recognition for his extraordinary acts uh, and well-deserved recognition, obviously, which is a Medal of Honor. We are proud to welcome Colonel Davis to the White House today as a Medal of Honor recipient. Today, the Biden-Harris administration is announcing its 33rd security assistance package for Ukraine using presidential drawdown authorities as we continue to surge weapons and equipment that Ukraine needs to defend itself against Russian aggression. This package includes more ammunition for U.S.-provided HIMARS and howitzers that Ukraine is using so effectively to defend itself, as well as ammunition for Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, armored vehicle launch bridges, and demolition mun munitions and equipment. The, the United States will continue to rally the world to support Ukraine. We have seen incredible commitment from our allies and partners and applaud the more than 50 countries, including Germany. As you all know, his, Germany's chancellor will be here uh, in, at, the, at the White House uh, momentarily, uh, and that have come together to provide Ukraine with military assistance. These contributions are making a significant difference, enabling Ukraine to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Russia alone could end this war today. If they wished, they could end this war today. Until they are willing to do so, we will continue to strengthen Ukrainians' military on the battlefield so that they will be in the strongest possible position at any future negotiation uh, at the table. Now, uh, before we go to questions, I have a little bit on the week ahead, and I'll lay that out for you. On Sunday, March 5th, the President will travel to Selma, Alabama, where he will commemorate the 58th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. The President will deliver remarks at the Edmund Pettus Bridge and participate in the annual commemorative bridge crossing event. In his remarks, President Biden will talk about the importance of commemorating Bloody Sunday so that history cannot be erased. He will highlight how the continued fight for voting rights is integ integral uh, to delivering economic justice and civil rights for black Americans. In the evening, the President will return to the White House. On Monday, the President will headline the 2023 International Association of Firefighters Legislative Conference. On Thursday, the President will release his budget. The budget will show how the President plans to invest in America, continue to lower costs for families, protect and strengthen Social Security and Medicare, reduce the deficit, and so much more. We will have, of course, more details to share with all of you next week. On Friday, the President will welcome President Ursula von der Leyen of the European Commission to the White House. The leaders will review the strong cooperation between the United States and the <coughs> European Union to support Ukraine as it defends its sovereignty and democracy and, in, and to impose costs on Russia as for its aggression against Ukraine. They will also discuss U.S.-EU coordination to combat the climate crisis through investing in clean technology based on secure supply chains. 
The leaders, the leaders will, take, will take stock of the Joint Task Force on Europe's energy security that they established one year ago, which has helped the EU reduce its independence or dependence, pardon me, on Russian fossil fuels and accelerate its green transition. They will also discuss other international security challenges, including our work together to address the challenges posed by the People's Republic of Russia. With that, Colleen, good to see you. It's been a while. You have the floor. Um, Crete, it is your 100th uh, press briefing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I'm sure you're thrilled. Congratulations. How do you, how do you feel about that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. Well, cheers. Um, cheers. <laughs> so moving right along. Um, I wanted to ask about the DC crime criminal code again. Um, we're, we've been hearing that some of the House Democrats feel like they got thrown under the bus a little bit uh, by the president's decision not to step in on the um, effort to stop the overhaul, which is a lot of negatives, I understand. <laughs> but I think you know where I'm going. Um, so I wanted to know, you know, did the president give them a heads up on the decision? Was there any sort of back and forth about it? Um, so first, let me just say that the White House notified um, the um, uh, notified the members at the House retreat, as you know, uh, back that was uh, earlier this week, or is still happening in Baltimore. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, I do want to lay out that uh, the president and the administration has a very close relationship uh, with House Democrats and <laughs> Senate Democrats as well. Uh, we have worked together. The president has worked very well uh, with the members on delivering bold, um, historic pieces of legislation in his first two years of an administration uh, and is very proud of the relationship that he has with them. And our teams are constantly in communication with them. Uh, and so I'll leave that there. This is a very strong, important relationship for all of us here, including the president. Uh, I, I also want to state that, look, the president supports D.C. statehood. That is something that you saw in his SAP for this particular uh, D.C. crime bill. Uh, and uh, if Congress sends him a bill making a D.C. state, he'll always, always be sure to sign it because he's been, talk he's been talking about that for the last uh, two decades. Uh, but, you know, vetoing the bill headed to this, his desk now won't make, make D.C. Uh, a state. And so those are the things that the president is really in, has been very clear about uh, when it comes to D.C. and their statehood. And so I'll leave it there. But as it relates to the House, uh, as it relates to Senate Democrats, it is a very important relationship to, for us and, and clearly very important. And, and with the Senate uh, Democratic Caucus, as you know, when he met with them um, yesterday, he provided uh, what he was going to do and made it very clear to them, and they had that discussion. Um, I just also want to ask, so, you know, Biden and the Democrats have talked a lot about the need to stem, you know, rising crime, but also the need to reform a criminal justice system that still disproportionately affects you know, black Americans. So why not engage in some sort of compromise or why not let the DC bill, because you know, the mayor mm -hmm. uh, vetoed the criminal code, but she also proposed some changes that she thought would have made the system sort of better on the whole. So just want to be very clear here. And uh, if you look at the, the DC bill itself, and I know that um, there was a little bit of, of I was asked a, a couple of questions of uh, what else does it do besides armed carjacking? And I don't normally go line by line on, on legislation, especially legislation that we haven't introduced. Uh, but I did talk to the team, and we have a couple of things that I just want to lay out for all of you. And on what the DC bill does, it reduces maximum penalties uh, for off offense like murders and other homicides, armed, armed home invasion burglaries, armed, armed carjackings, as I mentioned, armed robberies, unlawful gun possession, and some uh, sexual assault offenses. And so, look, the president has been very clear. We need to do more to reduce crime, to make communities uh, safer, to save lives. And that's why he put together, he put forth his Safer uh, America plan that does just that that we believe does exactly that. So the way that we see this bill, it doesn't actually reform policing practices. That's not something that it does. Reform like the ones the president has put forward at the federal level. You know about the executive order when uh, it couldn't be done on the uh, Senate side, making, doing, uh, moving forward with police reform, the president put forth a historic piece, uh, uh, a piece of an executive order to get to, to try to do what we can at the federal level, and so we believe that this bill does not actually do that. Okay. Uh, question on on the meeting today with the German Chancellor. Uh, not long ago, both Chancellor Schultz, uh, along with 
President Macron mm -hmm. reportedly told Zelensky that he would you know, soon have to make difficult decisions, urging the start of peace negotiations. Does the president see that as a sign that the united front that he's worked so hard to maintain, you know, maybe not that united that much longer? And, and how much does he see today's sit down as a chance to just urge Schultz to, to stay the course? Stay so, the look, the president is looking forward to, for a productive meeting uh, with the German <clears throat> chancellor. They first met. Um, I don't know if some of you have been tracking this, but they first met uh, when he became German Chancellor um, early last year, I believe on February 7th, uh, so soon after he t clearly took office, and they met here at the White House. And over the past uh, past several years, they've seen each other at the margins of the G7, uh, in at the summit in, in Germany, a, at NATO, at the G20 summit, and have talked by phone regularly. And so this is a clearly a relationship that has been uh, that has been growing over the last year. And so you know. What we're seeing, what he's, how we see this meeting is a bilateral cooperation uh, to talk about a range of issues, global security, uh, economic issues, and at the forefront of, the, of this meeting that they're going to have, this bilateral that they'll have sh uh, pretty soon, it will be on Ukraine. And that coordination is going to continue. You saw the president in, in Warsaw. You saw him in Kiev. Uh, you saw him uh, really uh, having a bilat with uh, the B9, and uh, well, a, a meeting with the B9, a bilat with the president of Poland, and all of those, uh, all of the actions and the meetings that the president has had over the last just several months uh, is showing, I think, the strength, the strength of uh, of, of the union, the strength, the strength of the EU, the strength of uh, the, uh, what you're seeing with the NATO allies in Europe in the West. And so I think that's going to continue. We believe that's going to continue. Uh, remember, when when Russia, when Putin first started out on this war, he thought that NATO would be divided. He thought that the West would be divided. And we just have not seen that. We, if anything, we're seeing uh, more coordination and more support for the people of Ukraine, uh, for President Zelensky and the efforts that they're doing on the ground uh, to defend their democracy. But you are seeing signs that the approach may start, is starting to look a little bit different, right? You say over and over again here, the President says, you know, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. And yet you do see some allies saying, you know, it is time to get to, get to, the, to the negotiation table. They're concerned that they'll be able to, to do this for as long as it takes, as the president says. So does that not spark concern and worry amongst but, the president? But look, Mary, we want this war to end. We do. We want this war to end. But it doesn't look like Russia is going to do that, right? And it is up to, they could, they could end this, end, this war today, but they're not. And so what we're going to continue to do is support Ukraine the best way that we can. We just announced, I just laid out a PDA, our 33rd a drawdown uh, since this war started. And we're going to continue to do that, continue to give them the support that they need uh, on the ground. And look, you've heard President Zelensky talk about peace and wanting, uh, wanting to move forward with peace. But at the same time, we have to make sure we strengthen their hand when those negotiations happen, uh, that they are in a place of strength. And so that's what you're seeing from, from this president. That's what you're seeing from the allies uh, across the globe. And you're going to see the president meeting with the German chancellor today. We're going to continue to show that, uh, that supportive front, uh, that coordination. They're going to have that discussion. Uh, and you saw that last week when the president was, uh, was in Eastern Europe. I guess just, it's sort of a housekeeping matter, but has the president had a chance yet, or does he plan to speak with former President Carter or members of his family, given, I don't think they've spoken yet since the news of his house was Yeah, there. there's, I don't have a, um, a call to preview or to announce, as you know, and I've said this many times before, and I think you, many of you have reported this, that they've known each other since 1976. It's a, it's a relationship that has uh, spanned many, many decades. Uh, the president certainly and the first lady, their hearts are, uh, are with the, uh, are with President Carter and and his family. I don't. Ha I just don't have a, a, a conversation to preview at this time. Given the importance of that relationship, is it something? You know, it, it seems odd that it hasn't happened yet. I, no, guess. I, I mean, look, uh, we you know the president uh, when it's time when it's time and appropriate. Certainly, that conversation will happen. I just don't have anything uh, at this time to preview. Okay, no. Um, so an EU official just said that the two sides are working toward an agreement in principle on a very limited. Um, agreement that would create a free trade-like status for uh, the EU that would put it on par roughly with Canada and Mexico in terms of the IRA. Can you say anything more about your hopes for reaching some kind of a deal um, 
at least on a very high level when Thunder Lion arrives next week. Yeah, I don't want to get in ahead of, uh, of that meeting. Clearly, that's going to be another uh, important bilateral meeting uh, focusing on the coordination, of course, on Ukraine and other important uh, uh, security issues and economic issues, as you just laid out. Uh, that uh, both sides care about, right, the American Union and clearly the United States. As it relates to the IRA uh, investments, uh, the clean energy future will be invented and built and made in America. That's why we see the IRA's investment. The President will never back down from putting American jobs and American leadership at the heart of his strategy. Taxpayer dollars should go to support American jobs. Uh, and American in innovation. Uh, but the IRA's benefits uh, expand beyond the U.S. Our investment will help drive down costs for clean energy, which will help <coughs> other nations as well. That's how we see uh, this important uh, law that uh, the President clearly fought tooth and nail for. And it's going to go further and faster in building their own clean energy economies. I'm not going to, again, get ahead of, uh, of a meeting that's going to happen next week. Uh, but the President and we have been very clear on how important we, th we feel the Inflation Reduction Act is, uh, and uh, again, we're always going to make sure that uh, we support American American jobs and clearly American uh, tax dollars. But I think the question is, how important is it to you to remove this irritant in the relationship at a time when you're looking at a protracted war in Ukraine, potentially China uh, delivering lethal aid? I mean, is it important to shore up the? alliance and at this point remove irritants of this trade. I mean, look, the, the, clearly the relationship is important to this president. Uh, you have seen him across two years uh, rebuild our relationship with our allies, uh, something that was almost decimated in the last administration. We have a president who understands the importance of those types of uh, foreign leadership relationships, who had them for many years uh, before becoming president. And so, of course, we want to make sure there is a good working relationship. Uh, and uh, we're, you're going to see you're going to see him continue to do that. Again, I don't want to get ahead of what the agenda is going to be or what's going to be discussed uh, with um, with the EU next week. Well, what I can say, it's an important conversation that will continue. Well, that we they will have. It'll focus on clearly Ukraine, that continued coordination and support for the Ukrainian people as they are bravely uh, fighting for their democracy. And just one on the domestic front, on the budget. Um, to what extent are you expecting the care economy and all those proposals? that got you know, removed from the previous uh, pieces of legislation to come back. Will we see those items come back in one by one? So I'm not going to get ahead of the President's budget. It's going to be released uh, next Thursday, uh, March 9th. Uh, but clearly the President uh, remains committed uh, to, uh, to fighting for paid leave and child care policies. That is something clearly he fought very hard for it uh, in the beginning of the year as we were trying to move forward. Uh, with uh, that piece of legislation. And so, and we believe uh, fighting for uh, uh, what I just mentioned, paid leave and, and child care, is going to help grow the economy. It's going to help give American families and Americans across the country a little bit of a breathing room. But again, I'm just not going to get ahead of, of the President's, uh, uh, of the president's uh, budget that will be out. Uh, next week. Yeah. Thanks, Green. Uh, just following up on Colleen's question on the D.C. crime bill, uh, the House Democrats who are expressing anger and frustration, uh, they are in part saying that they wish they had known sooner what the president's position would be. As you know, a whole bunch of House Democrats already voted against the bill. Um, why didn't the White House make this position clear before that vote had taken place in the House? So, look, when we put out the SAP, um, uh, I think it was around the State of the Union, I think that's when the SAP came out. Um, we were very clear on where and what where the president was, which is making sure that he continues his commitment to D.C. statehood. And that's what you saw uh, in, in that SAP, in that support for D.C. statehood. Uh, and at the time, you know, many times, many even earlier this week, many of you were asking me, I think your colleague was asking me uh, which direction the president was going to go. Uh, and he never made that clear in that SAP. And I think as it was becoming, we always let, we always let the, the, uh, the process in Congress go through, right, whatever mechanism they take, however it, it moves forward. So we never, we're always very clear and careful about that. But as it now looks like it was going to come to his desk, uh, we wanted to communicate where we were going to go. 
uh, we wanted to communicate uh, how the president was going to move forward uh, with um, uh, with this particular bill, and we did, and we uh, we laid that out. He, we're explaining that now why he he is moving forward in that way, and the White House and congressional de Democrats, as we have known, have come together on many different things to deliver for the American people, and the president wants to continue to do so. I guess you know the president supports DC statehood. He's been clear about that, but he's not going to veto this bill from Congress, which does amount to Congress sort of meddling in DC's own <coughs> government, right? So how do you square that circle? Both things can't be true. No, we believe uh, both things can be true. Look, right now DC is not a state. Uh, this is coming to the president, right? This is something that's coming to his desk, and he has to take action. I just laid out a moment ago to Colleen uh, why we felt that this bill doesn't actually deal with police reform. Uh, this president has been someone for many years, many decades, who has always put the safety of American, American families, uh, certainly across the country first. That's why he put together his Safer America plan uh, that lays out 100,000 cops in communities to work with communities to make sure that communities feel safe. The cops, uh, the cops plan. That is something that the president started as senator. It's something. It's actually uh, a, a policy that Republicans want to not fund, uh, and and take that away. Take away. Uh, uh, an, a way, an option uh, to make communities safe. So this is something that the president cares about uh, very strongly. And the way that we see it is that this is coming to the president's desk. This is not a legislation that he put forward. D.C. is not yet a state, even though he supports D.C. statehood. And he had to make a decision. Uh, and uh, look, again, we let the process move forward in Congress, and we felt this was the time to, to make that decision. Just had a quick follow up on East Palestine. Um, Senator Manchin said this week that the president visiting there would give confidence to the residents. Um, obviously, I know you guys haven't announced anything, no plans right now for him to go there, but do you think it could make a difference for the president to go, even if all that accomplished was to give some sort of reassurance to many of the residents there who are still very worried and upset about what happened? Look, you, I, I believe you heard from the president just yesterday, who said that he is uh, he is he's planning to go there at some point. What he's going to do is uh, he we're going to when that happens, he's going to co we're going to coordinate with state and, and local officials to make that trip occur. Look, what the president has been focused on is making sure that we make the community, the people in East Palestine, <laughs> whole again, uh, to make sure that uh, they get what they need to feel safe, uh, to make sure that they feel like their community is healthy again. That's why uh, the air, that's why we made sure that the air is safe, right? That's why we made sure the water is safe. But he understands uh, how the community feels about what happened and what occurred in their, in, in, in you know, in, in their community this past couple of weeks. That's why HHS, FEMA, uh, FEMA, DOT, EPA have been on the ground, and it's been a multi-agency effort uh, to make sure that they get what they need, to, to make sure that they have that safe air, that safe water, as I just mentioned. And the last part of that is we're going to make sure that Norfolk, uh, Suffolk, is, uh, is, is, is held to account for the mess that they created. And that's what you're seeing. You're, you, you've seen the EPA administrator. He was just there for a third time. And so the president's committed. He's keeping uh, abreast or updated on a daily basis on what's going on on the ground. He's, he's talked to the governor of Ohio. He's spoken to the governor of Pennsylvania, the senators, multiple times uh, to make sure that they are getting everything that they need uh, from the federal government. Thank you, Kareem. You mentioned the SAP that the administration put out on February 6th, but it's not a broad statement about D.C. statehood. It specifically says that the administration opposes the resolution that would dismantle the crime bill. So when was this policy reversed, and why weren't House Democrats notified about the reversal? So from, I'll say this. Um, there was never a change of heart on where we were um, with, uh, uh, with the SAP. The SAP, the way that it's laid out, speaks to um, the president supporting D.C. statehood. That is, what, that is where we were. Uh, that's what we were at the time, wanted to make sure that we, again, lifted up where the president has been for the past decades, making sure that uh, D.C., uh, you know, fighting for D.C. to become a state, and we actually say in the SAP that if uh, you know if um, 
you know, if Congress wants to move forward in that way, we should p pass H.R. 51, make, make D.C. the 51 state. And so we never laid out where, we, where the president was going to, uh, was going to go. Uh, once that once it came to his desk because we wanted to allow uh, Congress to move forward in the way that they normally do with the mechanism when a when a piece of legislation moves forward And so we never said anything at this time now We're communicating very clearly now that we know that this legislation is going to be in the president's at, at, at the president's desk uh, We're making very clear and communicating that where the president is is on this on this legislation but you, wait, I'm sorry it it, it specifically says the word opposes. So is it that the administration wasn't aware of the content, the specifics of the crime bill, and now you are aware, and the president says he doesn't support some of the changes that the DC Council put forward? Because when you release to the SAP, um, I, I'm assuming, maybe incorrectly, that you were very aware of what the council was proposing. We were aware of what the council were, pose, were proposing. What we're saying was that we wanted to make sure that we continued the president's, uh, the president's continued push for, uh, for statehood, and that's what we did. That's what we did in the SAP, and that was what was the most important thing that we believed. Um, there was no veto threat in the SAP. There really wasn't. We may have, it may have been, I just read it while you were asking me, that we didn't oppose, we opposed it, but there was no veto threat. Uh, so I want to be really clear about it. It stated our support for D.C. statehood, it, but it did not indicate what the president would do should the bill come to the desk. It did not say that. It did not lay that out. Now we're communicating that very clearly. We communicated uh, with the House Democrats days ago when they were in Baltimore. And, uh, and again, I said this, uh, I said this uh, to MJ. I remember many of you asking where we were going to go, and I said, we don't have any. We don't have a decision yet. We don't have anything to share on this, uh, on where the president's going to be with this particular bill. And now we are because we know that it's going to come to his desk. There must be some state laws that the president also disagrees with um, that have to do with crime, and he obviously doesn't have the power to do anything about that. I, I'm trying to square his decision to use his power to do something in D.C. while he's also saying, you know. The federal government, you know, shouldn't should allow them to be their own state because DC is not a state. So, so th he this can, bill and therefore he should. DC is not a state, so therefore the bill is coming to his desk, so he has to make a decision. It's as simple as that, Weija, right? Because DC is not a state. Now, he wants DC to become a state. We've been very clear about that. He has said that for decades, that he believes in DC statehood, but it's not. A, it's not. And so therefore, because DC is not a state, when bills like this come uh, occur, it goes to the president, and he has to make a decision. And that's where we are. It's as simple as that. Now, if D.C. becomes a state, yes, the president believes that it should be governing, for city should be governing uh, on its own. That's what he believes. But until then, they shouldn't. But D.C. Ouija, D.C. is not a state. Right, but I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm asking because he does have an option to veto. That is one action right. he could take. But again, this is a president that believes in keeping communities safe. He believes in keeping the 700,000 residents in D.C. safe. And so he's taking that action because it's coming to him. We didn't put this legislation to get forth. This is not our legislation. This is a, a legislation that is coming before the President of the United States because D.C. is not a state. It's just not. So he has to make a decision. So he's going to make a decision that will, uh, that will help the residents of D.C., that will deliver for the residents of D.C. And it's as simple as that. Thank you. Okay. I'm seeing two perhaps parallels here in the discussion about the uh, the SAP, which is the Statement of Administration Policy. Isn't it really boiling down to there was one train here that was saying that uh, the administration opposed this, and then really when the recognition takes place, that this would make the president look anti, um, tough on crime, that the wheels stopped and now you have a new position. Isn't that really what happened here? What I can tell you what happened is that there was no change of heart 
Yes, in the in the language, I just read it as as uh, uh, read it again as Ouija was talking uh, was asking her question. There was the word oppose, but we never indicated, which is not unusual. It is not unusual for a SAP in the SAP for the president to not indicate if he will veto or if he will sign. It is not unusual to do that. Now that we know that it's going to come to his desk, we're communicating that very clearly. The president communicated that with all of you yesterday. And so now we have made a decision of where we're going to go with this particular uh, piece yeah, of legislation. Because, you know, those of us who cover this read these things all the time. The general public may not even know what we're talking about here. No, but it seems I'm like pretty there sure they're not. Yes. <laughs> so so there, I'm pretty but sure there was is. a there was a bureaucratic push in one direction on this, and then when it reached a certain point, and. Uh, Crime is a big uh, issue in America in certain cities. We saw it reflected in the election in Chicago. We know it's a concern. It's been a concern in the city that many of us live in here. And then boom, the president has to make a decision and he's going a different direction than the administration set up. Isn't it really just that simple? I wouldn't say it's that simple. First of all, let me just step back for a second. Uh, this is, when you look at crime and the rise of crime over the last couple of years, this is something that the president inherited and he took action, right, with Safer uh, America Plan and making sure uh, that he did everything that he can using the tools that he has in federal government to put forth a plan uh, that will keep communities safe. I talked about the 100,000 cops to put them in communities, working with communities to make sure communities <coughs> feel safe. And that's not just that. There's the COPS program, right? And we're going to see uh, from the president uh, budget, how his commitment uh, to, to that, to his commitment to COPS. What we are seeing is uh, we saw D.C. Council put forth a, p uh, a piece of legislation. They're not a state. Uh, they went through their processes, right? They went through their mechanics. It, en it ended up in Congress. We put out a SAP saying, yes, we oppose it, but also we support uh, D.C. statehood. That's what it says uh, in our SAP. But we never indicated from that where the president was going to go because we were also letting that process play out in Congress. Now that we know that it's coming to the desk uh, of the president, the president, we're communicating where the president stands on this piece uh, of uh, the D.C. crime bill, this piece of legislation. The other sharp turn quickly um, yep. on East Palestine. Not going to go, not visiting, no plans to visit. Not at this, uh, not at okay. this time, as but you heard the from the president. The president says, okay, we're going to go there at some point. At some point, Okay, yep. so there's a political critical mass that has been building and it would appear that this is one of those national events where people will not be satisfied until the president himself goes there even if you have all of your important uh, cabinet level officials go so it also appears as if not going to go not going to go okay now we're going to go so what are the factors that will be required for the president to go? Is it a specific deliverable that he can bring? Is it a specific invitation from local officials? Is it a certain kind of window where he will feel comfortable? Well, he already got a, an invitation from the governor. I think you heard the governor said he's welcome uh, to come to Ohio. He's been to Ohio many times before during his administration, so it's not, a, an, it's not unusual for him to, to go there. Look, I don't have anything to preview. The president was asked a, a, a question and he answered it very honestly. Uh, and once we have more to share as to as if there is a trip uh, ahead, you know, we're going to coordinate, it would be coordinated with the state and official uh, officials on the ground, and we'll certainly lay out you what that could. I mean, the president himself said, no, I have no plans to go, and then yesterday well, said, he'll go at some point. So I'm just trying to get I think what he is was, the switch. He was asked a direct question, and he's been he's been updated throughout, uh, being regularly updated on, on uh, what has been happening on the ground by his team, by the uh, local and state officials uh, in Ohio and Pennsylvania. And, you know, I, I will just leave it there. We know the president. He answers a question very honestly, and he pro he said, um, you know, sometime in the future I will probably go. Uh, but I don't have anything to share. We don't have a plan for the president to go at this time. We don't have anything to preview to all of you at this time. It's just a, he, he who has asked the question, he answered it honestly. Thanks. So just uh, on the D.C. issue, just one point of clarity. Does the president right. view this as a one-time interference in D.C. affairs, or does he hold up the that's possibility a hypothetical that, that could I mean, that's a hypothetical that I can't answer from here. This is we, There was a specific issue that came before us, and the press, and the press yeah, but it's, you're, you're asking a hypothetical that I can't answer at this time. Uh, Senator Menendez urged the president yesterday to appoint or, or nominate a Latino American to the as Fed vice chair. Um, can you say, I know you don't want to get ahead of the process, but can you say publicly whether a Latino American is under consideration? For I, I, I'm not going to get ahead of the process. Okay. 
Hey, um, a couple questions. Um, one is I wanted to ask for the administration's response to Walgreens saying that they won't distribute abortion pills in states where Republican governors have asked them not to. Um, want to know what you all are thinking and are you concerned that other pharmacies who have been threatened with potential legal action will follow suit? Yeah, I have a, a statement here that I want to read out to all of you. So elected officials targeting pharmacies and their ability to provide women with access to safe, effective, and FDA-approved medication is dangerous and just unacceptable. Uh, we've said this before, I've said this before, uh, 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 pills, this pill that has been on the market for more than two decades, uh, more than two decades, and is, is regularly used for both miscarriage and management and, and uh, abortion, as also it's used in more than 60 countries. Uh, the Department of Justice has already independently issued an opinion related to this issue that is at odds with this dangerous effort. This is, this is all a part of a continued effort by anti-abortion extremists who want to use this arcane law to impose a door, uh, backdoor ban on abortion. The administration will continue to stand by the FDA's expert judgment in approving and regulating medications and in the face of bar barriers to access and, and concerns about safety of patients, healthcare providers, and pharma pharmacists, we will continue to support access to this critical medication within the limits of the law, which is why the president issued his January uh, recent presidential memorandum that aims to preserve continued access to a safe drug that and will uh, emphasize again is used for miscarriage management and abortion. So that is what we wanted to say on the Walgreens front. So it sounds like you all think it's, it's dangerous. Are there any sort of um, mechanisms that you see for continuing to provide access in those cases? Has the White House been in touch or the administration been in touch with Walgreens? I mean, it's huge. Pharmacy no, throughout much of the country. No, totally. I, I totally understand, which is why we're saying uh, this is uh, unfortunately unacceptable and dangerous. Look, the Department of Justice is uh, independently uh, uh, is issued a, an opinion related to this. I'm not going to get ahead of that, or I'll just, you know, make sure, you know, uh, refer you to that. But I'm just not going to have anything more than what I just laid out. Uh, shifting gears totally. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, inflation. The Fed said. Uh, today, actually, in its semi-annual report to Congress, uh, it suggested that more rate hikes would be needed to curb inflation. And I know you all have been fairly confident that inflation is slowing and that this would all lead to a soft landing. I'm curious if you all still feel that a soft landing is possible, and if so, can you help me understand why you are so confident in that assessment? And we have said that it's... It, there's going to be a, uh, it's going to, go, it's going to go into a steady and stable growth, and sometimes there'll be some up and downs, right? We have been very clear about that. I think the last, uh, uh, Brian Deese's last briefing, he actually laid that out for all of you. Look, the way that we see it, and the reason why we feel very confident in this, is that the president's economic agenda, the way that we see it, uh, and others have as well, is that it's it's uh, it's making progress uh, to bring inflation down. You have uh, inflation that's down by 30 percent from last summer, uh, but we always understand that there's more work to do. Uh, the whole, and we also understand that the way that we got here is because of COVID-19, is because of Russia's war against uh, Ukraine. All of those things have disrupted global energy, food supply supplies and cause inflation to spike around the world. But the president is going to continue to do everything that he can to lower costs. You're going to see his uh, March 9th budget in less than a week at this point. He, we lowered, uh, we hit, we helped to lower gas prices by a buck 60. It is now at a, by a buck 60 a gallon from its peak from Putin's war. Uh, the real wages are higher than they were seven months ago. And so we're going to continue to do that. Let's not forget uh, when we, t when we think about the, 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 um, uh, the pieces of legislation that were passed under this president, uh, capping uh, insulin uh, by 35 bucks uh, per month for seniors on Medicare. Those are the things that matter. Now we see farmer companies like Eli Lilly doing doing the same, but for all Americans, capping at 35 bucks. Those are the things that we're going to continue to work on to lower uh, to lower uh, uh, costs for people. And uh, and so again, you're going to see the president's budget next week. But the data the data shows us how inflation is has been moderating over the last six months, and we think that's important to speak to. It's been, yeah. I would say, rather sticky. Well, and that's why we say we have more work to do. We're not saying that we don't have more work to do. We say this every time we talk about inflation, every time we talk about the economy, we say that there's more work to do. That's why the president takes extra steps. Uh, like the IRA, uh, takes extra steps to make sure that we bring down costs for the American family. But 
it, the data shows it has indeed moderated. And so that's what we look at. That to your to your question, original question, that what gives us um, some encouragement uh, that uh, that we will get to that st steady and stable uh, growth. Uh, I uh, just want to go back to uh, the bilateral. Last time uh, Chancellor Schultz was here was just a few weeks before the start of the war. Yeah. Uh, back then, in the, lead, in the lead up to the invasion, there was really an effort by the president to sort of gather up support, unite the allies, and be prepared to sort of react as quickly as possible with sanctions, with help to Ukraine. Are these similar conversations happening right now between the US and European allies, other allies, to be ready for the possibility that China sends weapons to uh, Russia and to be ready to act quickly the way they were ready to act quickly a year ago? So first of all, as you know, they had a G7 call just last week. The president was uh, in, in, in Ukraine and he was also in Poland. There's constant communication with our allies. Uh, that the president is having, it doesn't. It doesn't. They're not one-offs here. They are. They are consistent and, and they are continuous. Uh, and so I just want to be very clear uh, there. And look, you know, we have said this over and over again. We have not. Uh, you know, we have not seen any. Uh, we have not seen any. Um, any. We haven't yet seen China do anything yet as it relates to uh, lethal, lethal weapons. And we believe that uh, Russia's war in Ukraine has put China in a difficult position uh, to actually, uh, you know, to actually move forward in that direction. Every step China takes towards Russia makes it harder for China uh, with Europe and other countries around the world. But, uh, you know, uh, want to be really clear on that piece. But you, as, I, as I've mentioned before, Secretary Blinken met with Wang Yi just recently in Munich and made himself really clear. They had a very uh, clear conversation. And keeping that communication, uh, that line of communication open is very important to us as well. But again, we haven't seen China take that action yet. Uh, but we've been very clear and had conversations with China. Another one on uh, the IRA. Uh, this meeting uh, with uh, Chancellor Schultz is one of several meetings with European uh, leaders. When President Macron was here for the state visit in early December, uh, the message of uh, the administration was we are in listening <coughs> mode, we are hearing the concerns of our European uh, allies, uh, and we're having discussions. Has there been any progress, any change, or is this still? hearing, listening mode, and? So I spoke to this a little bit. Uh, these relationships are clearly important to us. They're, we're still in listening mode. We're still in discussion uh, and just don't have anything more to share on what's next with that. Uh, but we think uh, we think the you know Inflation Reduction Act is incredibly important to the American people, to our taxpayers. We're always going to make sure that we support American job and American innovation. The president will never back down from that. And so I'll just leave it there. Uh, Tennessee's governor signed two anti-LGBTQ bills into law on Thursday, one that bans many drag performances from taking place on public property, uh, another bans most gender-affirming care to transgender youth. Uh, what does the White House make of these laws, and is there anything you can do or planning to do about these laws? So I'll say this. The American people are focused on so many issues. We just talked about economy. We just talked about inflation. We're talking about safer, safer communities and schools. Uh, and good health care, all of the things that you all ask me every day. And you all know that's what the American people care about. That's what, even when they went to vote uh, in November, those were the issues that mattered the most uh, to them. But instead of doing anything to address those real issues uh, that are impacting American people, right now you have a governor from Tennessee has decided to go after drag shows. What sense does that make to go after drag shows? How does that going to help people's lives uh, who are thinking about uh, the economy, who are thinking about making sure their kids are going are, are going to be safe when they go to school, or their communities are safe? But that's what he wants to focus on. So it's part of a larger pattern uh, from elected officials who espouse freedom uh, and liberty, but apparently think that freedom of speech only extends to people who agree with them. And that's what we're seeing uh, from what's happening in Tennessee and other places as well. So. 
um, you know, don't take my words for it and uh, of, on this issue. The governor himself hasn't been able to, uh, if you think about this particular issue, he hasn't been able to cite any examples, anything, to show that uh, drag shows in public spaces are a problem. He hasn't. He hasn't laid that out at all on why this is an issue uh, for American people. So I've said this before from here. I said this, I believe, last week, and we'll, we'll keep saying it, that these ridiculous policies aren't just unnecessary. Uh, they are dangerous. They, are, they uh, vilify our fellow Americans. And uh, at the time when LGBTQ Americans are facing higher risk in, in violence, uh, mental health issues, and it is unacceptable, it is completely unacceptable for a governor uh, to be moving in this way, uh, to be uh, with such a bill, and is, um, it is also unfortunate. So what's your message to the LGBTQ youth in the state, as well as drag performers? What's your message to them? So the president always has been very clear when it comes to um, vulnerable communities like LGBTQ uh, community that he has their backs. And he has a record to show that. He has a record that, uh, that shows that he supports this community and will continue to be there uh, for the community uh, as, uh, as long as it takes. Go ahead. Thanks, Green. I want to go back to something um, I asked you just the other day. We're talking about safer communities, um, and that is the issue of cartels. Uh, the attorney general was asked whether or not he'd be open to uh, labeling the top cartels in Mexico as more terrorist organizations. He said he didn't oppose the idea. Just yesterday, Bill Barr, uh, his predecessor, uh, Merrick Garland's predecessor, went a bit further saying that the U.S. should have a military presence inside Mexico. So now it's the two most recent attorney generals, one in a Democratic administration, one in a Republican administration, basically saying, we can do more about this issue going forward. So a, a couple questions along that line. Does the Biden administration need to reassess its posture as it relates to taking on these cartels? I'm just not going to get ahead of what the Department of Justice said, of what Merrick Garland said. Um, as you know, they, they move in an independent way. Um, I'm just not going to get ahead of any policies that may be coming out from the Department of Justice, and I'll just leave it there. What about um, Bill Barr suggesting that maybe we put a military presence or have a military presence inside Mexico? I'm not going to comment, has, has the not gonna comment on, on what Bill Barr has said. But has the president ever thought about that idea or I, considered but, that idea? But you're asking me to comment on uh, Bill Barr, who was the attorney general during Trump's administration. I'm just not going to comment. The pool. What about the general idea, oh, though? okay. Hold on. Um, so the pool has to gather. What's the plan? The Schultz visit. Oh, the Schultz visit. Okay. All right. So what are we, what are we doing? We're going to wrap it up? Wrap it up. Okay. All right. We've got to wrap it up. Sorry, guys. Have a great weekend.